Welcome to Tabletop Gaming Guild. Tabletop Gaming Guild is all about the experiences and memories that playing tabletop games with friends and families can create. Today we'll be looking at an expansion for 878 Viking called the Viking Age Expansions. Not a whole lot of points for originality for the expansion title, but it gives you nine different modules you can try out. And I'll go over each module and then tell you my general feeling of the expansion as a whole. So this expansion adds churches, which change the setup like this. Instead of the normal wind conditions being determined by how many regions the Vikings control, the winning condition is Vikings having destroyed every church by the time the treaty would occur. This changes up the game in a couple of ways. First off, as the Vikings destroy a church, it'll be flipped and given over to the English side, which can give them bonuses they can trade in for. Also, the Vikings have the ability to build forts to get a foothold in the territory. So they can turn in unit, two units to build a fort. And then from then on, anytime somebody attacks that fort, you get two dice in defense. The Vikings can flip this over to a settlement and that will start producing units. The other key effect of these is when you generate new units, they can actually start at these forts. They seem like small changes, but they actually have a pretty significant impact because it means that while the Vikings have a relatively easy start, as they manage to destroy churches, the, that means the English have a focal point where they know the Vikings are going to want to attack so they can amass their power and not have to worry about spreading it out so much to fend off attacks from all directions. So overall, I would say this particular module favors the English side, which if you played the base game, I found generally favored the Vikings. So it's a nice little change up there. Expansion number two is pretty straightforward. There are four powers that correlate with the four regions of England. And those powers start on the English side. And they maintain those powers as long as they control all or nearly all the cities in that region. The Vikings, however, can gain powers by controlling all or nearly all the cities in those regions. And the powers are mostly benign, although Wessex is pretty significant. That said, even the most benign power can make a huge difference, such as one of them allows for one extra unit per reinforcement phase. But one unit can actually make a huge difference in a battle. For the expansion number three, you are going to deal out one king to each player. They're basically super events that can change the flow of battle. Module number four adds rune dice for the Vikings and prayer dice for the English. Adds a little bit of luck to the game. Basically when you go to battle you can choose to roll a die and it goes on the card. You could then choose to spend that die or save it for a future turn and the Vikings get abilities that they can use for you spending ruins. The English on the other hand have more of a variety in their dice. They have one side on each die that triggers martyrdom. They don't have a choice. That automatically triggers. And that means that their units cannot use command. So basically leave the territory to go into another battle or get out of get to safety. But basically that's the concept. You're rolling the dice, you're spending them or saving them for more powerful effects. Expansion number five adds English holy sites and Viking ruins. At the beginning of the game, the English will flip two holy sites and put those on the map, and those give special abilities, often to the English as a whole, but sometimes just to that region. And those abilities are maintained as long as the English control those holy sites. As for the Vikings, they get relics. So the first two Viking leaders that are placed on the board each get one relic. They give that leader extra powers that can be used as long as that leader exists. Module number six adds legends, which are basically goal cards. So each Viking leader will get a legend card and that'll give him an objective. If he achieves that objective, he takes one of the control markers off the control track and places it on this card that'll get him closer to victory. From the second turn onwards, 
The English will also be getting a legend card each turn, but they can only have one active incomplete legend at a time, so they may have to discard if they already have a legend active. And if they complete one of their objectives, they will take one to provide it extra control markers and put it back onto the control track, meaning the Vikings now have to do more work to be able to win the game. Module number seven adds epic battle events to the feared deck. And when the English would draw a feared card, if they happen to draw a epic battle event, that affects both sides and it'll change up how the battle plays out. Such as this card that means that any command face rolled counts as basically a shield. And there's also one in here that's pretty cool that any hits taken during a battle go to the retreated area instead of out of the game. Module number eight is definitely one of the more thematic modules of the set. In this module, you have Viking ships. When a Viking leader lands in a territory, they put a Viking ship and they now control that territory and can use it to reinforce. Leaders can also use those ships to travel from sea coast to another ship on another sea coast territory. However, if the English enter that a territory with the ship, they automatically burn it. And if the Vikings have any units in the retreated section, they would lose two of them. Module number nine gives the Vikings two more leaders they can play with. Ragnar makes the English more likely to retreat. Ligurtha? Maybe I'm pronouncing that, maybe not, who knows. It's actually set aside and at any point can tag along with another Viking leader to give the Vikings more mobility because they'll have two leaders on the board going on at once. So those are the nine modules for the Viking Age expansions for 878 Viking. So overall my impressions is it's essentially giving you scenarios but in a way that allows you to mix and match and rebalance if you feel that one side plays stronger than the other in your games. But the biggest thing they do is put a focus on the actions of the game. So a lot of times that means specific territories tend to be the focus of a lot of the battles or just maintaining these powers can be vital. So it goes from a free form, all oh, the Vikings can attack anywhere to this is what we're trying to do specifically. It's a nice mix of modules. Some of them are definitely going to appeal to people who like 878 Vikings and war games in general. Others will appeal to more hobby gamers, be good options for introducing somebody that's new to this style of game. Overall, I think it's a pretty strong expansion, a lot of variability, a lot of replayability to this game. If you do like 878 Viking, I would say definitely pick up this expansion. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to check us out on other social media such as Instagram and Facebook. And don't forget to like and subscribe.